uh, its information and start inferring uh, things like springs vulnerabilities, the difference between springs discharging from different geologic units, uh, the effects of elevation or aspect, any number of things, as long as we can get a robust enough data set. So the more springs that we can inventory, the better these results will be. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we've partnered with Grand Canyon Trust a lot of these inventories, and I can't <laughs> say enough about how helpful they've been in the entire process. From their enthusiastic volunteers, which have just been imperative to helping a, a program of one person, uh, their botanical expertise, the assistance and the training of new volunteers to uh, conduct this work, the refinement of the assessment protocols, both in the field and once we're back, uh, trip organization and logistics, I can't say enough about, um, and as well as getting into things like database entry and the development of new maps for upcoming trips and things. Additionally, we partnered with the Southern Colorado Plateau Network of Parks. Uh, they've also been a really valuable uh, partner in the protocols for data consistency, uh, hydrogeology and hydrology experience and expertise and manpower coming out into the field. The development of long-term monitoring sites based on the results of some of these inventories. Comparison to the Grand Canyon data to other parts within the network as well as outside the network. And finally, the incorporation of other indicator assessments and other protocols that they've developed, such as macroinvertebrates and total riparian system health. Uh, here's just a couple of examples of a, uh, some site sketches from uh, some inventories that we've done over the past year or so. So, we're collecting all these data, and what exactly are we using them for? Well, for one, is to be prepared to quantify the effects of potential um, threats to these resources in the future. Now, I don't have much time to go into the full list of threats that, uh, uh, to springs and seeps of Grand Canyon, nor am I going to be able to uh, give the ones I am going to present their just due. But I would like to just uh, provide an overview of a few of them for you tonight. Now the first one I'd like to talk about is groundwater use. Uh, this is a photo of an old hand-hewn log trough receiving some piped water from Robbers Roost Spring over on the North Rim. Now groundwater developments on the Coconino Plateau threaten springs resources along the South Rim. There's an estimated doubling of population in this region between 2000 and 2050 with a corresponding demand in uh, and water demand as well, with a predicted unmet demand by 2025 based on the current supply mechanism. Uh, now, the region is in, uh, not new to using groundwater resources, such as this little trough uh, at Santa Maria Springs along the Herm Hermit Trail, or this big tank uh, receiving water from Tip Over Spring on the North Rim, but we're talking about uh, groundwater use on a much larger scale these days. Now currently, Grand Canyon doesn't, um, doesn't contribute to this demand on the Coquinino Plateau as its supply comes from the North Rim, actually. Now as I said, all of the water that Grand Canyon staff and the millions of visitors that come through there every year is supplied from the North Rim, Roaring Springs. Now for those of you who are unfamiliar with the, uh, with the system, the whole thing is put together by the engineering marvel known as the Trans Canyon Pipeline. And uh, so here's Roaring Springs on the North Rim. It sits about halfway up on the north side. Some of that water is piped up to the uh, North Rim developed area, but the majority of that water is transmitted via gravity down to Phantom Ranch in the Colorado River, crosses the river underneath one of those uh, suspension bridges, and then just due to the uh, the weight of the water and the gravity and the head and the pipe from traveling that, uh, that much vertical distance, it has enough force to make it all the way up to Indian Gardens before it needs to be repressurized again. At Indian Gardens, there's a pump house that repressurizes that line and brings it the rest of the way up to the South Rim for you and I and all the European tourists to enjoy. Um, now, during high flow portions of the year, that pipeline only uh, siphons off a couple percent of the discharge of Roaring Springs. However, during base flow periods, uh, that pipeline takes about 40% of the total discharge of Roaring Springs to put into this pipeline. Now, since there isn't any uh, predicted decline in water demand for the uh, South Rim developed area anytime soon, any 
decrease in the base flow of roaring springs is going to correspond to a much larger percentage being taken off for this um, pipeline. Additionally, this is a very energy intense uh, process. 75% of the energy budget for Grand Canyon is used to either transport or to treat groundwater. And finally, this uh, whole system is uh, well beyond its original planned lifespan, uh, and the park spends millions of dollars every year in, in repairs and patch jobs on that pipeline. So moving back over to the, to the South Rim, in the uh, South Rim developed area in Tucson, there, there are six active wells pumping from the recharge area of a number of South Rim Springs, uh, pumping about 300 million gallons per year in the 1999 estimate, and maybe uh, quite higher than that today. Now, ground modeling, uh, groundwater modeling has linked regional aquifer withdrawal with spring flow decline, ranging from anywhere about 1% at Havasu Creek, 2% uh, at Hermit to upwards of 10% at Indian Gardens. Exacerbating that is the fact that the region's been in a drought since 1998. Uh, punctuated by just a couple wet seasons, namely the 2004-2005 winter and the current one that we're just uh, exiting this year. Now another threat uh, that's been receiving a lot of press here recently, and uh, there's actually going to be a congressional hearing on, uh, on the South Rim tomorrow, open to the public if anybody's interested in attending, is uh, uranium mining. This photograph here shows a small uranium operation, uh, the head frame, uh, on the Canam Plateau, just a couple miles from the park boundary. Now, the Grand Canyon and the, the region surrounding it isn't new um, to mining. It has, actually has a quite rich mining history dating back to the late 1800s uh, with a number of incursions uh, looking for copper and asbestos and things. Um, in the 1950s, uh, with the Cold War, uranium surpassed copper in importance and uh, began, became a refocused interest. Uh, through the 1970s, with 1980s after the Cold War and a re, uh, corresponding <laughs> drop in the price of uranium, that interest kind of uh, waned substantially. Uh, this is a photo actually of the Grand View Mine uh, on Horseshoe Mesa during its heyday. Uh, it always surprises me of how large of an operation it actually was. Uh, and this is a schematic of the workings of the Orphan Mine, which is just uh, west of the developed area there on the South Rim. Now, re more recently, renewed interest in uranium mining and a corresponding spike in the uh, price of uranium led to thousands and thousands of new claims on the plateau surrounding Grand Canyon in the past couple of years. Well, in response to that, last July, the Secretary of Interior closed a two-year withdrawal of about a million acres for new mineral entry on the plateau surrounding the Grand Canyon. To take a time out to examine the potential effects to the canyon watershed. Now, this did not apply to valid existing claims that, have, that were on these plateaus, and there are actually a couple of uh, up and running operations as we speak. An, env an environmental impact statement is currently under development with a focus on the hydrogeologic characteristics of the area and the ties to springs and seeps ecosystems. Now, what exactly um, are these folks looking for, and how does this tie to springs and seeps? Well, the, um, the features that they're, they're targeting are known as uh, breccia pipes, and there are thousands of these features on the plateaus surrounding Grand Canyon. Now, how they're created is by a collapse of a solution cavity in the, in the red wall limestone down here and an overlying scoping and fracturing and falling in of the overlying beds. Water was concentrated uh, millions of years ago by fluids transporting themselves through this material and depositing in the fractures and the rocks. Now, the top, uh, the bottom of these pipes in the red wall limestone is actually the top of the R aquifer, regional aquifer, where a lot of these uh, springs were sourced out of. So, additionally, oh, um, additionally, that other aquifer system, the C aquifer I uh, was mentioning, although it isn't saturated in the region, it does hold a lot of uh, small perch zones of water and is directly smack dab in the middle of the, uh, the most highly mineralized zone of these pipes. And here is the location of the R aquifer, showing that these are often uh, connected systems. Now, the investigation into the potential for mining 
um, to affect groundwater supplying these springs and seeps has led to a number of unresolved issues.